You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. Hey everyone, welcome to the second edition of the Useless Information Podcast Retrocast. I have a whole bunch of great true stories for you today. Uh, before I get to that, I should mention that my wife was originally supposed to do this podcast with me today. We tried recording it yesterday, but we really had no luck. Her microphone wouldn't work properly. Her voice just kept going in and out, in and out. And I think that's partly because she has a softer voice than I do. And I'm not sure what was going on, so I did send an email to the company, and they said they'd be getting back to me shortly. So hopefully we get that resolved, uh, and she'll be back on in another episode. Uh, I should mention the two of us just returned from our va- our first vacation in a couple of years. We went to the Poconos, in particular, we went to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, which is an incredibly beautiful place. Uh, if you ever get a chance to get there in your lifetime, I highly recommend it. It really, really is a great place. Uh, we did a lot of hiking, biking, did the usual museums and so on. In fact, my favorite thing of the whole trip was taking a tour of a real coal mine. They take you about a quarter mile by train into the mine, then you walk around. And sadly, when we left, my wife and I just kept, we, we just couldn't stop talking about how bad the lives of these miners were, particularly in the 1800s, late 1800s, and early 1900s, before there were any labor laws. Just an awful, awful life. Um, But we did really, really enjoy the trip as a whole, but the coal mine was something that really stood out to us. Anyway, let's get into today's stories. The Sacramento Bee reported on January 19th of 1916 that 15-year-old Rolla Boswick had run away from home. Now, his home was located on San Francisco Boulevard in Sacramento's Colonial Heights neighborhood. Well, a passerby spotted Rolla on the road to Stockton, learned of the reason he left home, and then he went and informed the police. But what was most interesting about the story was the main reason that Rolla left home, and it was a very, very unusual reason. You see, he was unable to master Latin. And here's the text of the note that Rolla left for his parents, quote, Mom and Papa, I have gone away because I didn't like to stay here and have you worry about me, and I thought that since I couldn't get a job here, I could somewhere else. Please don't worry about me, for I will get along till I get a good job. Please don't worry about me or try to hunt for me. It's no use sending me to school as I couldn't learn Latin. And of course, it's signed Rolla. In response, his father, that's George W. Bostwick, stated, Just a kid trick. Now, the passerby said that Rolla would be home by nightfall, but that didn't happen. On January 25th, Deputy Probation Officer Cook told a reporter that officers had lost track of Rolla, and they really had no idea where he was. Well, on February 5th, another probation officer, that's Officer Wilson, said that Rolla had sent a letter to a friend in which he gave his return address as general delivery in San Francisco. It's unclear what happened next, but Rolla clearly came home at some point, And that's because he's listed in the newspaper as having performed as part of the Westminster Presbyterian Concert Orchestra on June 3rd. This was followed by another concert on June 21st that was sponsored by the nearby Fruit Ridge District Parent Teachers Association, you know, the PTA. But my guess is he still hadn't mastered Latin. (laughs) So here's a question for you. In the last retrocast, I mentioned that Vinylite, a.k.a. vinyl records, were introduced during World War II due to a shortage of shellac. Yet, nearly all records in that time period played at 78 RPMs. Well, not exactly. It was 78.26 RPMs. Now, I get a little, I'm going to get a little technical here. But basically, they used a motor that turned to 3,600 revolutions per minute, and they used a 46-tooth gear in the mechanism. So 3,600 divided by 46 gives you 78.26 revolutions per minute. Okay, uh, enough of the boring math. Um, No matter what, 78 revolutions per minute is an incredibly high speed. That record is going around more than once every second. So a typical record could only hold three to five minutes of music. And you know what that means? That means one song per side of the record. You know, if you want a complete symphony, forget it. It's just not going to fit on the record. As a result, the slower playing 33 and a third RPM records were later introduced. And of course, slower speed meant that you could get more music per side of the record. So my question for you today is in what year was the 33 and a third RPM record introduced? 
Now, for those of you who are not familiar with records, and I know there's a vinyl craze going on right now, all the records you can pretty much buy, the albums you can buy today, all play at 33 and a third RPMs. So in what year were those introduced? Well, hang around for a bit, and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. On March 5th of 1924, Mrs. Ralph Hall of Big Run, Pennsylvania, went to nearby Clearfield, which lies approximately 25 miles or 40.2 kilometers to the east of Big Run. You see, Mrs. Hall had recently lost a child and desperately wished to adopt another child. So she first went to the county commissioner's office in Clearfield, and they referred her to the local children's home. There she met Mrs. Florence Parker, who was an assistant at the home. Mrs. Hall told Mrs. Parker that her four-year-old son, Billy, bore a strong resemblance to the son that she had just lost. So Mrs. Hall would spend the remainder of the day playing with young Billy, and at the end of the day, she made a highly unusual request. She asked Mrs. Parker if she could borrow Billy for a few days, and surprisingly, Mrs. Parker agreed to loan out her son. The deal was quite simple. Mrs. Hall would take Billy back to Big Run with her, and then Mrs. Parker would follow a few days later to meet up with them. Of course, she'd stay a few days at the Hall home and then take Billy back home. Yet a couple of days after Billy left with Mrs. Hall, Mrs. Parker began to feel as if she had made a terrible mistake. She had made a poor decision. An investigation was made and it was soon learned that all the references that Mrs. Hall had provided, they were real. But there was one big problem. None of her references had ever heard of Mrs. Hall. Billy Parker had been kidnapped. A search for the missing boy was soon underway. Billy's uncle, that's Dean Reed, was able to trace the kidnappers and Billy to various points within the state, and they all were within a 50-mile or 80.5-kilometer radius of Billy's Clearfield home. That included Du Bois, Reynoldsville, Indiana, Brookville, and most famously, Punxsutawney. At one point, they were sighted in Cleveland, Ohio. On Saturday, August 9, 1924, that's five months after Billy had been kidnapped, his uncle, Dean Reed, received a tip that a couple and a young child had been staying at a hunting camp in the mountains of Rockton. But after Reed spotted the couple, they were arrested and they led Reed up into the mountains where they spotted Billy carrying a bundle of wood. Mrs. Hall's father, that's Cyrus Fauci, had been watching the boy and he was also arrested. All three suspects were placed in the Clearfield jail. Mrs. Hall's husband, Frank, not the Ralph that she had told Mrs. Parker, Her husband, Frank, claimed that the couple had separated four years earlier, after which Mrs. Hall, whose first name was Florence, gave birth to a baby boy. When the couple later reunited, Mrs. Hall told her husband that young Billy was the child she had given birth to. He claimed they had taken to the mountains a few weeks prior not to hide out, but instead to pick berries and sell them. On September 30th, Florence and Frank Hall were both found guilty of kidnapping. Mrs. Hall received the most severe sentence that was an indefinite period of detention at the state industrial home at Muncie, and Mr. Hall was sent to the Western Penitentiary to serve a a three-and-a-half to seven-year term. Mrs. Hall's father, that's Cyrus Fauci, he was released because they believed that he had no knowledge of the kidnapping. He was basically just helping out his daughter. Girls... Imagine shampooing your hair without water. Shampoo without water? You're kidding. No, honest. You can do it with Minipoo, the marvelous new dry shampoo. Minipoo is grand when you're down with a cold and don't want to wet your hair. Perfect when you have an unexpected date. A Minipoo shampoo is so easy. Takes only ten minutes. Wonderful for oily hair. And my wave? Minipoo won't disturb your wave. Where? Oh, where? At drugstores everywhere. M-I-N-I-P-O-O, Minipoo. Personally, I think that Minipoo ranks up there with the worst name products of all time. I'm thinking things like Nova. Remember they had the Nova cars? Well, it turns out that Nova means no-go in Spanish. Uh, here in the Albany area where I live, in Albany, New York, uh, we have a regional bakery called Fryhoffers, and that was purchased a number of years ago by a company, a Mexican company called Bimbo Bakeries. And every once in a while, I go into the store and I see loaves of bread with the label of Bimbo on it. Clearly, that one doesn't work too well either. And then uh, yesterday, I was actually looking uh, through old newspapers and I came across an ad for Gay Ola Cola. 
Gaola Cola. It was a, com- a competing product for Coca-Cola. Clearly, that name wouldn't work today either. Now, clearly, they're trying to tell you that you can get a quick shampoo with this, a mini poo. But honestly, anything with the name poo in it is not my ideal for a name of a product. That commercial, by the way, is from the January 11th, 1950 broadcast of Burns and Allen, which I've commented before on the podcast is among my favorite of all the old-time radio shows. This particular episode was titled Getting a Movie Contract. Now, uh, I have to say that Gracie Allen's campaign to be the President of the United States and her concerto for Index Finger are among the most memorable, at least in my mind, among the most memorable comedy performances of all time. So if you've never heard either, I really do encourage you to check them out. And Concerto for Index Finger was part of a movie, so you can actually find that online. Go to YouTube, and there's a clip of her uh, doing the Concerto for Index Finger. It's hilarious. Now, the reason I chose the Mini Poo commercial is that it reminded me of a product that my parents sold in their pet shop for a couple of decades. It was called 8-in-1 Perfect Code Dry Shampoo Powder. Now, my brother and I also sold it in our online pet business, which we sold off in its entirety in 2010. Now, Eaton One had a version for both dogs and cats, although my hunch was they were both the same product, you know, with different labels. I have to tell you, the product was an incredibly slow seller, but it allowed pet owners to more easily freshen up their pets, particularly the ones that hated water baths. And if you've ever tried to bathe a cat, you know exactly what I mean. It's pretty rare to find a cat that likes bathing. And it's not that dry shampoos really clean a person's hair or your pet's fur. The product, which is basically a dry powder, that could be talc, cornstarch, or fuller's earth. Fuller's earth is uh, bentonite clay usually. Uh, Think cat litter, the old-time cat litter that is grinded up into a powder. And that clay absorbs the oil from your hair, and of course they add some fragrance to the powder. And once the powder absorbs the oil, it gives the appearance that one's hair is clean, and of course the fragrance made your hair smell better. But I would argue that if you got all this powder added to your hair or your pet's hair, are you really cleaner? Uh, I would bet that you're no cleaner than before the product was applied. (laughs) Now I couldn't find a whole heck of a lot of information on Mini Poo. Its trademark was registered with the U.S. Patent Office on May 20th of 1940 by Annette Jennings Incorporated, of which Annette R. Jennings was president. The company was located at 17 East 16th Street in Manhattan. And while Mini Poo is no longer being manufactured, there are still a number of companies selling similar products, so if you wish to give it a try, they are available. Now, there is a can of Mini Poo at the Smithsonian, and you can see it on their website at si.edu. That's si, Smithsonian Institution, si.edu. Just do a search for Mini Poo, and the image will pop up. The description states, quote, This particular package was probably produced by the Stephanie Brook Company of New Jersey during the 1960s when the advertising slogan was, when you can shampoo, mini poo. Yet I believe that to be incorrect because there's a modern barcode on the package and barcodes weren't widely available until the 1980s. You didn't see them on packages prior to that. In 1944, Radom Poland resident Malik and Lengweg and a number of other people stood before a Nazi firing squad. When the guards opened fire, the bullet that struck Malik hit his forehead and he was buried in a mass grave under a layer of dirt. Yet, surprisingly, he was not dead. You see, the bullet had only glanced his skull and it knocked him unconscious. Then upon regaining consciousness, Malik dug himself out. He concealed himself among the other prisoners, you know, most likely those who were working to bury the bodies. And when the SS guards changed shifts, Malik was able to rejoin the remainder of the prisoners in the camp and survive. When the war ended, the UNRRA, that's the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, they stepped in to help Malik and so many other displaced refugees reestablish their lives. In March of 1946, it was reported that he was studying medicine at the University of Marburg in Germany. A scholarship from the UNRRA was covering the cost of his education. Now, I did try to find out more on Malik, but I was unable to find anything. I don't know what happened after this. My suspicion has to do with the spelling of his name. His last name is spelled E-L-E-N-C-W-A-J-G. Very unusual spelling. And if it's just a little bit off... Uh, You really can't find anything. 
So uh, we can only assume that he went on to be a successful doctor and had a good career. At least I hope that's what happened. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here to listen to a few words from our sponsors, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back. In the previous retrocast, I introduced a new segment called Footnotes History, and it's just five little tidbits that appeared in newspapers throughout the years, and there's really nothing to research on these, and they're almost impossible to rewrite, so I'm just going to read them word for word as they appeared in the newspapers back then. And our first story is dated July 27th, 1899, and it's from the Tri-States Union newspaper on page one. And I should mention this is Orange County, New York, not Orange County, California. It's titled, Cows Killed by Lightning. Charles Hulse of Ridgebury, this county, had four cows killed by lightning during Saturday afternoon storm. The bolt followed a barbed wire fence to where the cows laid next to it. Mr. Hulse lost a horse by lightning during a recent storm. The next paragraph reads, The barn on the farm of Thomas Lee at the reservoir in Middletown was struck by lightning but did not take fire. And the last paragraph is, At Howells, four miles west of Middletown, there was not a sprinkle. Leg broken three times. Lad suffers triple injuries within three minutes. Columbus, Ohio, June 25th, 1913. Daniel Sullivan's right leg was broken three times within three minutes. Returning home from a picnic, he fell off the wagon and a front wheel ran over his leg, snapping it. He attempted to crawl out between the wheels and the rear wheel ran over the leg, again breaking it. Then, the farmer backed the wagon and the rear wheel ran over Daniel's leg, breaking it again for the third time. Ouch. This next one is titled Truth in Business. London, May 28th, 1949, United Press. An office appliance firm today offered its customers desk trays labeled Too Hard and Left for Tomorrow instead of the conventional incoming and outgoing. April 11th, 1952, New York, United Press. A thief broke into the Greenwich Village apartment of songwriter Holly Houston early Wednesday morning and escaped with 200 phonograph records, ready for this, all hog calls. Which makes me wonder, she's living in New York City and she has 200 records of hog calls? What's she doing with them there? And second, do you realize how heavy they were back then? Those are probably the old shellac 78s. They must have weighed a ton. Imagine the surprise when that person, that thief, got home and realized they were all hog calls. Incredible. And the last one for today is dated June 11th of 1957, and it's titled Helicopter Melon Thief, Brawley, California, United Press. Former W.I. Fifield said he didn't mind a helicopter landing in his watermelon patch Saturday. He thought it was too much, though, when the pilot hopped out, grabbed three melons, jumped back in the copter, and took off. So early in the podcast, I asked you what year the 33 and a third RPM record was introduced. And if you answered 1948 or something close to that, I give you full credit. Now, it wasn't the first attempt to create a 33 and a third record, however. Uh, RCA did make an earlier attempt at rotating records at 33 and a third revolutions per minute, but they made a fundamental error. You see, their records were still made of shellac back then, and the heavy weight of the stylus they used, it would just quickly destroy the records. After playing them a few times, they really weren't playable anymore. So the marketing and manufacturing of these records was quickly dropped. Then, in June of 1948, Columbia Records introduced their new 12-inch or 30.5 centimeter diameter records that played at 33 and a third revolutions per minute. And they made two major improvements over what RCA had been working on. First, the records were made of vinyl, which was far more durable than those old shellac records. As a result, they didn't wear out as easily, although the vinyl, I should point this out, will scratch more easily. Next, they reduced both the size and weight of the needle on its arms, which placed far less pressure onto the record's surface. And an added advantage of a smaller needle was that you would have a smaller groove, a thinner groove, which meant more music per side. 27 minutes of music per side, to be specific. Now, 
uh, that also meant that more than one song could be placed onto each side of the record. Ten songs on those shellac 78s would take up five records. You know, one song on each side would take up five records. So the companies, the record companies, would sell them in books or what they called albums. And that term carried over to the new 33 and a thirds, even though all those 10 songs would now fit on a single disc. And that's why we call them albums today. Columbia set the retail price of what they were coining the Columbia LP, or Long Playing Microgroove Records, at $4.85 each, which may seem cheap, but if you adjust that for inflation, that's $53 a piece. That's a lot for a record. But as manufacturing ramped up, of course, that retail price quickly dropped. Within four years, LPs made up nearly 17% of the unit sales and just over 26% of dollar sales. By 1956, the major record labels had stopped manufacturing its popular and classical releases in that old 78 format. And really, if you think about it, it's not much different from the time that it took for CDs to replace the vinyl LP. Now, most people believe, no matter what speed you're playing the record at, that they all start from the outside of the record and they play towards the center. But there are a few exceptions to this. There are some records that play from the center and work their way outward to the outer edge. Now, the reason for this is that classical music, if you think about it, the center of the record, as it spins around, there's not a lot of distance you cover there. And that's good for things that are relatively silent or quiet, such as when you're starting a symphony. But as the symphony builds and builds and builds and builds, you want more and more range. You want more dynamic to it. When you get to the outside of the record, to the farthest edge of the record, to the outer edge, what happens there is you now cover a lot of distance going around once, and that allows you to put more sound in there. So as a symphony builds and builds and builds, you want to move towards the outside of the record. So there are a few that play from the inside out. Well, that brings this second retrocast to a close. Uh, If you have any comments, suggestions, questions, or whatever, feel free to contact me. My email address is steve at uselessinformation.org. That's steve at uselessinformation.org. You can also use the contact form on my website or uh, use Facebook Messenger to get in touch with me. Just a reminder, my new book, that's The Flip Side History, is currently available. Also, be sure to check out my two previous books. Those are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. And all three books are collections of long-forgotten, quirky, true stories, you know, just like the ones you always hear on this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the Useless Information Podcast or your favorite podcast platform, and you'll have immediate access to new episodes when they're released. My Twitter feed is at Useless Infocast, and be sure to like the show on Facebook. You can just do a quick search for the Useless Information Podcast there, and it should pop up. Anyway, I'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new story, and uh, thanks as always for listening, and take care, everyone. Bye.